good morning or a good afternoon or good evening from wherever you're tuning in from today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here at the Pitt UN Summit Live Studio. My name is Kip Dooley. And I'm Renee Cumming. We're really excited to have you here today and to have with us to kick us off, Pitt UN Director Andreen Soli. Um, Andreen, uh, we are now five years in to this wonderful experiment called Pitt UN. Uh, and we've, we've been in person here with uh, members from over 63 institutions in the U.S. and globally. So tell us a bit about um, the, the successes that we've seen in the first five years and what you're really excited to carry forward as, as Pitt UN looks to its next five and hopefully many more years to come. Hi, um, hello, good morning everyone. I, it's morning for me, so <laughs> I'm a little blurry eyed, but um, it's been really wonderful for the last um, day and a half or so to be talking to folks about what um, Pitt UN has meant to them and um, frankly what it's meant to me. I will just say that uh, this work started as a part of my fellowship at New America and I know at the top of the program Anne-Marie Slaughter, our CEO, mentioned that um, Pitt UN was going to be transitioning out of New America at the end of the year. Um, in many ways, that's somewhat confusing for individuals because transitioning, what does that mean? What stops? What continues? But I just want to say that um, the relationship with our new fiscal sponsor, um, New Venture Fund, has existed since the very beginning. <laughs> uh, and so in many ways, what you are seeing is just a simplification. Um, my staff and team is coming with me and we are going to just continue the work um, around some of the more successful elements of what I think has been um, stellar work thus far from our um, educational institutional partners. I say this because, I say educational partners because frankly for me, public interest technology has always been about a multi-sectoral approach. Um, many people will remember that um, when I started this work, I said I wanted to um, public interest technology to be about a framework a framework that you take wherever you go as a student, particularly because of the theme that we're, look we're exploring here at San Jose State, workforce development. I really think a lot about what are the kinds of things that folks should be doing with the skills that they're acquiring at, the institu at their educational institutions. And for me, when I first started this work, it was really under, it was with the understanding that a lot of the technologists that I was encountering, they felt that they were better prepared to go into the private sector, that they understood the private sector incentive structure better than they did civil society or government. And for me, I said, we need to focus on how do we create educational programs, experiential learning opportunities that made public interest technology more legible across other sectors. <laughs> and so what does it look like for you to take your technical skills into government? I think some of the panelists this morning talked a lot about that from the city of San Jose. We saw some really good examples that he was offering up about, Albert, Albert was offering up about what it looks like to be a student that left Stanford University and went to work for the city of San Jose. And for me, that is a success. That is what I was looking to replicate when I started the work at New America, which is to be able to say that there are technologists across um, civil society, government, and the private sector. Now, it doesn't mean that you're gonna be applying and deploying those skills in the same way. <laughs> um, because again, incentives are very different. Um, the population that you're serving is very different. Um, the um, capacity that you have may be very different. The resources that you have may be very different. And I think we got a, a, a bit of some of that in the conversations that folks probably saw yesterday. Um, and so um, what I have been focused on and what we offered up initially when we started this work five years ago was to really focus on a couple of key things, which were educational offerings, which is what are the kind of courses that needed to be crafted and shaped so people better understood how their technical skills might be deployed out in the world. So for us, it was about a multidisciplinary approach. So it would be wonderful if we could put um, engineers in um, conversation with social workers and sociologists. And so that's what we funded as part of Pitt UN. One of the very first things we said was, you know what? Great to have all these wonderful ideas, but we need money. <laughs> <laughs> and so initially upon the founding of um, Pitt UN, which happened, I be believe, in March 2019, 
about a month later, we said we need to create a small grants fund. And that small grants fund was the Network Challenge Grants Program, which many people are familiar with. But actually, the Challenge Grants is not the first piece. It was about the bringing together of institutions to begin to talk to each other and to shape um, work together. Uh, and then the grants program came in, and of course, as with everything, money took off. <laughs> and so, in many ways, that's what people came to know um, and associate with us, which was the Network Challenge, which for us was a small grants program to incentivize faculty um, um, and institutions to collaborate with each other and to begin to develop the educational programs that we think would should happen. So we funded um, 60 plus reimagining of courses, reimagining or some new courses. And then we also wanted to talk about what would it look like to apply the things that you're learning in the classroom outside. And so for us then it was about experiential learning. And I think again this morning there were lots of conversations about what does it look like to help students imagine what their work life would be if they were pursuing their passions in government, in a nonprofit, or in the private sector. And so what we also did was fund a lot of experiential learning programs where students were part of interdisciplinary teams that were working in collaboration with a nonprofit. We did that with University of Michigan. Uh, quite a number of technology students were assigned to nonprofit organizations and they brought their their um, data science skills, their um, their knowledge of um, technology to nonprofits, and were, were able to add value to some of the things that nonprofits were trying to accomplish. And so we wanted to make sure that people saw real examples of what it looked like. And I often said at the time that I was sort of focused on two things, both creating the demand for the work by demonstrating what it looks like and also supplying the talent for the work and helping the talent understand better that they could take their skills into their local communities and they could um, service their community members in ways that were going to advance um, the community for all. And so that was sort of the early, those were sort of the early things we were thinking about. Um, the other piece of the work was also for um, helping faculty members find each other. When we started this work five years ago, faculty members felt like they were the only ones doing this work on the edge of their campuses, the edges of their campuses. And so when we got together, um, I came on board in, um, I'd say, March 2018. My first task was to pull together faculty members who had been surveyed in an early report about this thing we're thinking about called Pitt. And I pulled them together in um, the summer in upstate New York, and we started talking about the work that they had been doing. And I think the first thing that they were excited about was, oh, you're doing that too? I didn't know that. And so that was our charge, was to sort of organize a group of faculty members who felt like they had been doing this work in isolation. So that's where the network piece was always, mm -hmm. um, that, that was the foundational piece. Mm -hmm. So I just want to sort of ground us in why this existed. Mm -hmm, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And sometimes I felt a little bit um, at ease that in many ways people saw this as just a grants program as opposed to a community building program, a finding each other and a finding ways to collaborate with each other program. Mm -hmm. And now it has turned into a global program. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I've been to all the sessions. I've tried to sneak into many of them. Uh, everyone uh, seems to be more interesting than the other. But uh, yesterday we had uh, two uh, really uh, instructive conversations one around what was happening in Brazil, the other in, in Mexico, and there were so many uh, global perspectives. When you started this, mm -hmm. you said it was something pretty much local that went national. Now it's gone global. What is your vision for the global aspect of this challenge? And, that I, you've and, been and I'm gonna ask you to be brief, because yes, we have I so know. many great people here. I know, here. I know, so, so it's perfect, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. No, this is, and it's fine, because for me, the global is you define it for, you define it for us globally, because one of the things, the biases, and I think the thing that snuck into this work is that US-based institutions have talked about what the global institution means for them, what their relationships with global means. But for me, it's about what, how does, um, how have global members have been doing this work already, but they just don't call it public interest tech. I think there's always been sort of language globally about your relationship with government <laughs> and your relationship with civil society. And in many ways, the US was behind the eight ball. 
So um, for me, it's much more about now the US institutions can be in conversation with their global cohorts who have been doing this all along. That so frankly, it's about us getting on board, not global <laughs> getting on board. Yeah, really a ground up approach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A ground up for the US. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, Andrine, thank you so much for joining us here in the studio. I will hold this microphone for we'll you. We'll take it away from we'll her. We'll take it away. Yeah. And hide it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Um, so uh, up next, we're going to have a conversation with some of our, uh, our regional hub uh, leads. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, uh, Elise uh, St. John to come up first. Um, you can swap with, with Andrine. Yep. Welcome, Elise. It's great to you? have you here. Yeah. So, Elise, you were, and, and Renee is also uh, a Pitt UN member, and you came to this space as a, a member of Pitt UN at, at Cal Poly and, and worked on some challenge grants. Um, so, so, tell us a little bit about your role and why it's uh, so important to develop regional hubs now as part of the next phase for Pitt UN. So first of all, it was exciting to hear you talk about the global work mm. because I was funded through a project that was global. And so much, you know, we think of as to what Andreen was just talking about, that um, the US has been somewhat defining that. That work is happening. It's happening in these local levels around the world. And so in that project that I had, we were able to see the cross-sector collaborations that were taking place and they were very, very much alive. And so um, in this work with Pitt UN in doing and helping um, really co-creating, this work again is already happening, right? Mm -hmm. It's happening at the local level. These grants that have been funded through Pitt UN, they're grants at, the, you know, with a PI at a, at a local university. And the regional work then helps these, pe you know, helps catalyze um, the work that's taking place. And it actually, it's, it's rising it up a level. We think, well, regionalizing, you're making it smaller. They're actually catalyzing and taking all that work and, you know, helping to institutionalize that, the pit work within a region grounded in the, in the issues that, um, that the institutions are serving. You know, I'm going to make a very shameless plug here for our work at the University of Virginia, Please. our network, yeah. which has been really, really exciting uh, being part of that. Uh, Elise, one of the things that you always do, you bring an excitement into the space. Tell me about that motivation. What keeps you doing this work? Um, a lot of things. So first of all, I'm an education researcher by training, so I have spent so much of my career thinking about incentive structures within universities, K, really K, K, you know, K-20, what motivates and what enables people to do this work, the work that they've come to do. Um, so I like to think about how do we support people to do the work they love. Um, I love to think, again, also about how to break down some of the barriers that keep us from doing that work. So it's like the individuals. How do you help the individuals do the work But they what love? would be some yeah. of those barriers? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Good name, too. How much time do we have? <laughs> so I don't know if you were in the last uh, session with the R1 and MSI. Mm. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. Um, you know, what are the challenges of getting the, you know, the MSIs and R1 universities to be able to take advantages of the resources, and particularly the challenges of MSI is to be able to get the same resources of the R1s, and then even the incentive structures for R1s. The reason why there are R1s is because they get these millions and millions of grants. So it's large research universities and minority-serving institutions, yeah, but, and know, how can they work together? Yeah, how yeah. can they work together? But also it's like, let's look at the incentive structures. That's mm. a problem, right? When that's how you get R1 status. So anyway, th that's just one example. How do we help, how do we enable um, faculty to be able to come into this work while they're still trying to get tenure. How, you know, how do we, you know, with the, you know, the overhead funding, you know, the 40% the that, that faculty members, you know, must give up when they submit for a grant and then there's not much left over. I mean, there's just endless, <laughs> endless barriers, but I guess my energy is I, I 
get excited about what we can what can be done together and so you have to work with those barriers and I don't know I well, that's why I, you do like the work the that you do. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I want to ask about some of the sessions that you've been a part of and that you've been leading while you've been here. Um, you know, we do so much of our work remotely mm -hmm. over Zoom and email, and then once you're in person, you get to have a deeper quality of conversation. So have there been any um, particular themes or threads from your conversations here at the summit that you're mm -hmm. excited to carry forward in the work with the regional hubs? Yeah, I, and I, again, I think this is the way um, I, I think about the regional hubs, but I, I am hearing everybody say, you know, we, we start with the work that we're passionate about. You find the people that want to do that work with you and, um, and build something from it. So I just keep hearing that theme that people realize that, yeah, it's about, it's about finding people doing something together and building from it. And I just keep hearing it. That's great. Excellent. Well, speaking of the people passionate about doing the work, we're actually going to have a couple of our, our regional hub leads come up now. We have Lisa Frazier um, from Ohio State University, uh, who leads the Pitt Midwest group. And we also have uh, Colette Basilier, who leads our Pitt New England group. Um, so come on up and, and join us, uh, and we'll, we'll continue the conversation. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. We're so excited to be here. Um, so I'm actually going to start with Colette. Um, so you were talking yesterday, Colette, um, in one of your sessions about how the Pitt New England group actually started as a meetup. Right. Um, so it was a fairly informal coming together of uh, researchers and practitioners who all care about public interest technology. Um, how did you go from that informal gathering to a more formal regional hub, and, and what has changed in that time? Yeah, it's been a lot. So the meetup started back in 2021, so this has really been an ongoing effort of the folks in Massachusetts and now New England who are excited about Pitt, and they want to interact with each other, and they want to figure out what is the best way to leverage each other's resources to create a larger impact in the region. And so what they wanted to do is figure out what that network needed to look like. And so when I started last year as we launched this formal hub, the two questions I really wanted to answer were, how can people benefit from a regional hub? How can they use this structure to really bolster their own programs at their own institutions and feel less siloed? And then the second question is, how can people contribute to the hub? What are the strengths that they bring to the table that they want to showcase? And then also use it in kind of support as we're growing this network in a larger way. Now, someone said that you have the secret to what a successful summer <laughs> fellowship program for students should look like. Tell me about that. Absolutely, yeah. So this past year, we launched our first program together as a network. So it is called the Impact Technology Fellowship. And this was leveraging, like I said, infrastructure that's pre-existing at our universities and our network. So Boston University has an incredible experiential learning infrastructure. UMass Amherst had open dorms. And then we had so much expertise from um, experts in the region that wanted to contribute to this work. So we actually had 21 undergraduate students from four institutions working together on six projects for nonprofits and government partners. And while they were doing this work, they got to engage with professionals in technical realms as well as PIT professional realms to really explore what PIT pathways looked like. And it was just incredible to see the success of the network and 84% of our students said that they're more likely to pursue PIT careers now as a part of this program. So we're so excited about the success. And what were some of those projects about? Yeah, that's a great question. So we had three tracks, data science, machine learning, and then software engineering. So software engineering focused on creating web apps for local nonprofits that were around voting and resources for constituents. And then in addition to that, we had machine learning working on um, some climate change projects with citizen science data, as well as um, NLP projects for um, a stutter speech community, and then our data science project, we're working with the NAACP of Massachusetts and also a local journalism nonprofit that was just starting up. That's brilliant. So very diverse, very, very multidisciplinary. Very diverse. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, that's fantastic. There's so many things that you can do with public interest technology. It touches so many spaces, and I think that's a good segue to talking about the, the Midwest hub. So Lisa um, is here with us from Ohio State, uh, so representing the Pitt Midwest group. Um, and so you spoke a little bit yesterday about how there's, um, you know, a lot of excitement and energy around bringing technology and, and data centers and tech jobs to the Midwest. Um, uh, some talk about it being the Silicon heartland. Um, I, I'm curious, as you've been meeting with other members from the Midwest, what are some of the unique opportunities and challenges that you see in your region that you're, that you're looking to tackle as a hub? Yeah, so... Um 
one of the one of the challenges uh, and opportunities of having all of this tech investment in this new Silicon Heartland is that those um, investments, of course, have environmental and health and social impacts, are likely to have those impacts on the communities in which they are placed. And um, that's not always part of the calculus of the decision makers who are trying to woo those companies into the Midwest. So this is not unique to Columbus. This is happening in Chicago as well. It's happening in other parts of the Midwest. And um, so one of the opportunities is actually, you know, we've, we've heard a lot at this summit and in Pitt UN in general about training technologists to go into public service careers, public interest careers, especially in government. Um, in the Midwest, so much of our governance is devolved into uh, non-governmental organizations and um, really to local municipalities as well. And so one of the really important things I think that in the Midwest we're focused on is not just training technologists or encouraging technologists to go into government service, but training those who are interested in social change and community change and community work the humanities, the social sciences, that technology is part of their context and part of their social, um, their social change agenda, and that they need to be prepared to serve that. And so that might, for example, look like taking a job at Intel or Amazon Web Services or Microsoft to inject some of that humanism and some of that social change, um, some, some of those social change frameworks into the decision-making processes. And how has that uh, process been for you? For someone like myself committed to data justice and, and algorithmic justice and just bringing uh, that kind of powerful advocacy to the work, how have you experienced that uh, in the work that you're doing? Well, so um, I'm gonna speak a little more locally to, to my work at Ohio State, but uh, actually companies, industry clients, industry companies, industry actors, understand that this is valuable and they actually want that engagement. That's been my experience in, in this work. Um, but they are used to dealing with engineers and technologists and, um, and business majors. And so it is a, they, they want that engagement, um, but they actually feel as much at a loss for how to engage with that side of the street as often government feels with engaging with technologists. Um, so I've actually been quite encouraged by that work because I feel like some of the, um, the, the local change, social change, the, the justice work that is so important to, to public interest technology, I think we actually have a lot of eager partners in industry and in private, uh, private firms. Um, but that is also our work, is building that bridge and, and saying, you know, there are public interest technologists who their technology is, um, is social movement. Their technology mm -hmm. is community organizing, and that needs to be brought to the decision-making table in firms just as much as the more technical side. Yeah. One, one other question I have for, for both of you. We're going to have um, a couple young PIP professionals come up and talk about their work um, um, supporting social justice movements with the technological toolkit. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, um, when, you, when you think about the students who you work with, um, what sorts of what sorts of, uh, of issues do they seem to be passionate about? Uh, who might be actually working in some of those roles in industry or in government or in nonprofits? Um, and what are they excited to uh, to tackle? You can start. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first part of your question was what sorts of issues students are. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the the wicked problems: climate change, climate resilience, climate justice, environmental justice, um, income inequality wealth inequality, um, polarization, um, resilience, sustainability in general. So uh, I find that students, 19 and 20 year old students are thinking about their children that they will have and their children's children. Um, perhaps more than some of us who are further along down the line there. Um, and so they are excited about what a new form of governance and a new form of public interest work looks like and how they can forge a career pathway in that, in that vein. Yeah, I think what's been really interesting is as students learn more about Pitt, their idea of where social change needs to happen also changes, which mm. has been very exciting to see. So that was a huge result of the summer program is students didn't realize exactly where Pitt could happen in their career pathways. So we saw a lot coming in of climate change and urban planning 
um, and democracy, but then as the program moved along, they realized accessibility was a big need that they were really interested in. Um, and then moving forward, they are now envisioning career pathways in a different way because of that work, I think, and in, in redefining what Pitt can look like. Um, so it's more challenging for international students is what the problem is, is because as they look at Pitt jobs historically, they cannot go and work in our local and state governments. So how can we make sure that we're opening doorways for them to be able to enter Pitt careers in a meaningful way that is not strictly defined by U.S. standards of what Pitt should look like? I'm just going to ask one more. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get tired doing this work? <laughs> I'm an extrovert, so no. <laughs> um, I absolutely love interacting with people, and I think that there's so many unique stories that go into this, and also just seeing people see themselves in Pitt is always my favorite part of the job. I have a three-year-old, so I'm always tired. <laughs> <laughs> but tired of doing this work, no. Good. No, and so, there's so much energy from the students. Um, yeah. I think sometimes it is easy to get disenchanted or, or jaded in a university setting because it seems like, everybody's kind of overworked and and burn out all the time students are excited about this work even before they have a name for it and we're excited about you and the work that you do thank yeah. you thank thanks you. so much for joining us we'll invite you to step off the stage and enjoy the rest of the summit um before we bring our next guests on i i did want to ask you renee about the data justice is it the data justice institute at, at UVA? So. Uh, most definitely. We yeah. have a, a data justice a summer program that's, that's right. run by uh, Dr. Claudia Schultz. Mm. And that program had uh, several cohorts, uh, students coming out to Charlottesville, uh, being a part of the uh, UVA community, and really doing some exciting projects. I had some students working with me on a digital surveillance project. Mm. That was exciting. We have uh, Dr. Don Brown, who leads our, our mission when it comes to health care. And many of the students were really excited about questions around health equity, health justice, and how do we uh, do data science for good. So at the School of Data Science, we really are trying to bring more value to the work that we do because we are committed to ethics. We are committed to a responsible uh, data science and responsible AI and really uh, building uh, communities of practice uh, at UVA that include the community of Charlottesville because so much of the research that we do is community driven, community inspired, and of course looking for those outcomes that could make communities thrive. So you know I am super committed to anything that uh, yeah. is about data justice, uh, algorithmic justice, and just ways in which we can get people involved in this conversation. That's fantastic, and, and actually our next guests who are going to come up are uh, Marissa Gerchik and uh, Toby Jagadi from the uh, ACLU, um, who are the very kind of young professionals who you are training uh, at, at UVA and, and through Pitt UN. Uh, we're going to scoot over a little bit this way. Um, uh, and, and so both of you are, are working at the ACLU. You can hold this mic just like that. Yep, good. Um, uh, working at the ACLU. Uh, using your skills as, as data scientists and, and algorithmic specialists to advance, uh, advance justice. So I want to just start by inviting you to introduce yourself uh, and your work uh, and, um, and, and kind of how you came to do what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is Marissa. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a data scientist uh, with Toby at the American Civil Liberties Union in our national office. Um, my work focuses specifically on algorithmic justice issues, and it's really about looking at the ways that automated systems and AI and algorithms um, mediate access to opportunity in a variety of really critical areas of civil rights and civil liberties, from um, housing to hiring uh, to lending and uh, many other areas beyond that. Um, in our work, some of the work that we do includes supporting the ACLU's uh, litigation, public education, and advocacy work related to AI and algorithmic justice. Um, and that includes everything from being a sounding board to attorneys who are trying to understand how a government agency is using an automated system to conducting statistical analyses, looking at the ways that um, algorithms can impact outcomes in really critical areas, um, and also uh, analyzing policy um, specifically related to AI um, and algorithmic justice and providing a technologist perspective on how that policy implicates civil rights um, and how that policy can be sort of future proof, recognizing where technology might go. Um, and also, I think one of the things that we're most passionate about is public education work um, and using our background as technologists to help demystify how those systems work and shift power dynamics around um, who's in control when automated systems are used, the control that people have over their data, and decisions that are made about them. 
Hi everyone, my name is Toby. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm also a data scientist at the ACLU. My work is a little bit different. I tend to focus on criminal justice reform work and also immigrants' uh, rights reform work as well. I've had some intersections with Marissa doing some algorithmic justice work where there is like, al algorithms used within the criminal justice system, so thinking about Compass and things like that and trying to make sure that we have public education, doing also some like um, work with data visualization to really make our work legible for the folks that are we're working with. My work includes working with lawyers a lot and also with our advocates to ensure that the sorts of things that are important to them, whether that is ensuring that there is more fair sentencing happening, are um, is brought to the public. And so my work has been informed a lot by like my own experiences and also thinking that I just want to be able to do good. And I feel like I've got the opportunity to a lot of direct impact through my role at the ACLU. So I was in your session yesterday. I was sitting in the back. Uh, and it really was very uh, instructive. It was also uh, very exciting. Uh, the students asked some uh, truly brilliant questions, but at the beginning, you were uh, doing some myth-busting, and one of those were uh, about uh, the careers in public interest technology. And uh, you asked a, a very critical question, which is, you know, what are some of the things that you heard? Uh, many of the students said, you know, no pay, low pay, you're not able to do the kind of impactful work that is necessary, your work may not be uh, re you know, getting the kinds of uh, recognition, it may be thankless work, and then you both said, you know, this is, this is great work, this is great work. So two different trajectories into the space, what makes this great work, public interest tech? Yeah, I think the first thing for me is just seeing direct impact. I can see like the numbers that I'm working with are not just numbers. They're, they're people, whether those are families that are separated and we have this data and we can use it to reunite families. And being able to see that directly happen is something that keeps me in this work and that brought me into the work in, into the first place. And I think what also is so great about working in this space is that there's always civil rights things that, that are happening throughout the world, regardless of administration, regardless of- Sadly. Like, sadly, <laughs> exactly. But I think that also provides endless opportunities to get involved, whether that's locally or at the national level. And so that's been a really exciting part of being in the work that I do. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with Toby that um, I think fundamentally data science work and data analysis work and the perspective that we bring to it is about storytelling. And so I think it's really amazing to be able to work in partnership with um, attorneys and with uh, um, policy advocates and other public interest advocates to bring interdisciplinary perspectives together to do public interest tech work. I think that's one of the things that I love most in addition to seeing the impact that our work can have, the impact that our work can have when we bring all of these different perspectives together. Um, and I think one of the things that is exciting about public interest tech is the growing recognition that it's, it's not just about technologists and that um, all of us have expertise about the lived experiences and the ways that technology impacts our lives, but also we need to bring philosophy and anthropology and psychology and policy analysis together. Um, and when we bring those things together, we can we can see really um, creative work. We can see work that envisions a future where technology works for all of us, um, and we can fight uh, some of the injustices that we're seeing around us and change the world. Indeed, and so you know one of the I think paradigms that public interest tech paradigms or mindsets that public interest tech is trying to shift is this notion that technology has some kind of magical power, it's going to come in and save us, or it's going to solve these wicked social problems that, that Lisa was talking about. Um, how do you approach the problems you work on differently? Because you're both technical experts, you know a lot about the technology and how to use it, you know a lot about data. Um, but when you're trying to tackle a problem like unfair sentencing or uh, you know um, access to justice, how do you um, approach it? In, uh, you know, understanding that technology is a tool, but not necessarily the solution. Like, how is that? How, what does that public interest tech approach look like in action, as opposed to a sort of product-driven uh, tech will save us uh, approach? It's a really great question. Um, I think. Fundamentally, one of the most important uh, aspects to recognize, as you're saying, is that um, technology is a tool. It's not necessarily always the solution. And um, I think the way we approach our work is by recognizing that it's about choosing the right tool for the job. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is a technical solution or a technical tool, and sometimes it's not. And so I think being really clear about that and honest about when technology is the right solution for a problem and when it's not is an important piece of that. Um, I also think we're in a unique position because sometimes we are building technology and we are uh, conducting data analyses and sometimes we're also critiquing technology and seeing ways that it's being used in harmful areas. 
Um, I think one of the things that can be a really exciting way to sort of recognize when it's the right tool and when it's not is through um, public education efforts to kind of flip the script around power dynamics related to technology. So one example that we worked on um, over the last year was uh, for a variety of reasons, um, it can be really hard for people to know how to use their data privacy rights or some of the rights under that they have under existing civil rights laws when they're interacting with online and automated systems. Um, especially in the context of things like when you're applying for a job online and you don't know if a resume screener is being used or some other automated tool is being used. And so we developed this resource, essentially building on the ACLU's Know Your Rights brands um, to develop a, a Know Your Digital Rights resource to help people understand, okay, what are my rights when I'm applying to a job online? How can I control my data? Um, and how can I sort of understand what's happening behind the scenes? Um, so I think projects like that are really exciting and recognize the ways that if we have agency um, and if technology is designed in a thoughtful and inclusive way, it can expand access to opportunity. Um, but we need to do that with mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And can we find that Know Your Digital Rights resource on the ACLU website? Is that available yeah. publicly? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I need to download that for myself. <laughs> I just have one yeah. final question. We're yeah. talking about rights and responsibilities, which are so critical to the work that we're doing uh, when we think about data justice, when we think about algorithmic justice. We also know that the technology moves so quickly, and sometimes it takes a while to build that kind of global consciousness or local consciousness or do the public education work. One of the most critical aspects of the space now is responsible AI and, of course, governance. When you think about the governance of AI and data governance, what would you like to see as people actually doing the work? What are we not doing in the governance space that we need to do in real time? Sure, yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot of things that we need to see in this space. I think one thing that... Um, one of the ways that I feel the most energized in these conversations is when we can have conversations that are interdisciplinary, like I said, where we have technologists and um, folks with legal backgrounds and policy advocates and people who are experiencing the harms of these systems that we're trying to um, fight back against or address the inequities within. Um, and I think it's really valuable to have sort of shared language in those conversations. And that's something that's often missing is um, we need to learn from each other. And it's not just about the technologists explaining how the technology works. It's also about everyone explaining how their perspective can come into the conversation. So I think that's a big part of it. Um, and I think also there are a lot of ways in which uh, regulation of AI and emerging technologies is sort of an afterthought, but it should fundamentally be part of the conversation from the very beginning, from the question of should we build this automated tool in the first place to all the way through how are we going to collect data to do this and who's represented in these data sets and who is not um, and what biases are in them uh, and how do we govern it and how do we make decisions about whether we should deploy this even if we've already built it, we don't necessarily have to. Um, I think that sort of like holistic view of regulation and uh, oversight is really critical. I want to end uh, with, with Toby, if you wouldn't mind. What's one piece of advice you have to a young person who's interested in becoming a, a public interest technologist and starting out in this career path? Yeah, I think I would say, like, I think when I was going into the work, I thought, like, formal education is the way to go, and mm. that's the only way you can do good work. But I think really think about what's important to you and think locally and think small, because I think those are the things that tend to be overlooked, and there's really good work helping it in your local government and the state government, and so starting there and thinking about like what's most interesting to you. And I think there are also so many open source resources you can use to get started. So I'd also encourage folks to like look for those resources, whether that's YouTube videos or Coursera, those kind of things if you need to tool up, because those things helped me through my, my process. And also looking at people who inspire you and think about what their path was like, um, reaching out to them. I know it could be scary, but like people, I would be super open to have people reach out to me. And I, th I think that's been really helpful in my career is to see people doing what I want to do and trying to follow them that way. That's great. Well, well thank you very much. Thank you. Marissa, Toby, thanks so much for joining thank us. It's great to learn about your work at the ACLU. And um, yeah. Wishing you extraordinary success thank on you. this journey. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks. thanks. Enjoy the rest of the thanks. summit. Yeah. Um, before we go to our next uh, segment with uh, Nia Brazel and, and Anjali Tandon from the Tech for Change Network, I do want to ask you a little bit about your story. Um, and you know, you've been in this space for quite a while now. So how did you get involved with public interest technology? Did you have a, a long technical background, or were you coming more from the social side of things? I'm definitely or? from the social side as mm. a criminologist and criminal psychologist and someone who had worked uh, for a very long time in, in government relations and, and in communications. And actually, it's the work in criminology, doing the work, working on those risk assessment tools and looking at the kinds of uh, outcomes I was seeing and realizing that we kept uh, using these algorithms that were not giving us any kind of real traction 
in the work that we wanted to do, which would reduce homicide and reduce gun and gang violence and really think about ways of, of, of reimagining the kinds of tactics and strategies that we were deploying on the streets. And then um, me just coming face to face with these algorithms and trying to find out more, you know, why were they creating these zombie predictions? Why were they overestimating these risks? You know, what were the questions around equity? What were the questions around data, historic data, and understanding even working for like over 15 years in policing and in homicide and understanding that so much of the uh, data that we were using continued to give us the same results and, and just thinking about the ways in which we needed to reimagine data or which uh, data scientists and criminologists and psychologists and forensic uh, teams need to work together to really build the tools and really do the good work. Because I think we all set out to, to make a difference and to, to really have extraordinary impact. But sometimes, uh, if we're using the wrong tools, uh, we're not going to get the kind of decisions that we want. And for me, uh, data is about really intelligent public decision making. And if we want to make the most intelligent decisions, if we want to deploy the best strategies and the, the best kinds of, of policies, we really need to have very sophisticated and intimate relationships in the ways in which we are thinking about data everything across the data pipeline. And of course, uh, when we think about AI, I always say there is no AI without data. For us mm. to do good AI, we've got to be doing even better data. Yeah, well, it, it's so exciting that we have this growing student network, um, you know, helping young people see uh, new career paths and, and gain new kinds of skills and understandings that probably didn't exist when, when you were coming up and, and getting your education. So we're gonna welcome uh, to the set uh, Nia Brazel, our, our Tech for Change Student Network Coordinator. Uh, and we also have Anjali Tandon from the University of Michigan, who's one of our Tech for Change leaders. So thanks so much for, for being here. Of course, thanks for having us. Yeah. So Nia, I saw you in action yesterday, <laughs> and you are an organizer par excellence. Thank you, know, you. You know how to network and you know how to organize. Mm. Tell me about what motivates you to do this work. Oh, so I've had the opportunity to work in a variety of sectors. I started in industry, did a little bit of time in academia, and now I'm here at Pitt UN. And I think seeing across each of those industries the way that people are trying to solve these wicked problems mm. that Lisa talked about earlier. Um, and then the greatest motivation of all is working with our students. They have so much energy. The way they talk uh, very critically and think very critically about each of these issues and these wicked problems that we're trying to solve gives me hope and inspires me. And when we get jaded or downtrodden sometimes, it, it inspires me to continue moving forward because we have these issues, we have these communities that need justice, that need accountability, that need their voices amplified. And it's so important that we are given opportunities to be able to advance that. And so tell us a little bit about the, the Tech for Change student network. What is it? Mm -hmm. Who's involved? You know, what kind of um, events or opportunities are you pulling together for students? Absolutely. So where Pitt UN is, has historically been at the institutional level, working with faculty and creating experiential learning opportunities for students, we want to provide opportunities to engage students directly. So Tech for Change is the expansion of the Pitt UN mention, uh, excuse me, mission where we are engaging with students directly. It is a national network of student clubs. It's student programming. It's all the opportunities to really engage the future pit practitioners early to let them know there is there are viable career opportunities in pit, And it's student clubs to create community, to really um, create access early on in their academic careers. It's hackathons to give them um, practical opportunities to be able to engage with the technology and create solutions. It's also career fairs to connect them with employers and really kind of create that pathway and that pipeline for career opportunities. So anything that where we can touch students directly that tech, falls under the Tech for Change umbrella. Uh, and we want to not only provide opportunities but provide community to let people know that there are more pit practitioners like them. So even if they don't have the language of pit or public interest technology, that they can know that their passions are viable options for them to pursue. Angeli, let's talk passions now. I know that you are passionate about tech for social good. Tell me about that passion and also the work that you're doing at the University of Michigan. Yes, definitely. So at the University of Michigan, I run a pit club called Tech for Social Good alongside some other folks who are here and some folks who are still back in Michigan. Um, our goal as an organization is really to do what Nia is saying and to do what Tech for Change as a whole aims to do, which is create community and give hands-on opportunities to engage with Pitt. 
I would say a lot of folks, especially in Michigan, where there's such a huge engineering base, there's a huge public policy base, um, they have an interest in PIP, but they don't have the language for it, nor do they have the people to really guide them into it. And so we try and give them an environment that's different from internships and different from classes in the sense that it's not stressful, it's not evaluative, but it still has that opportunity for hands-on learning. So that way they can kind of dip their toes in the water and we think that's the best way to build a real like pipeline long term into Pitt is just by getting a chance to see what Pitt work is like. Now, what excites you about the work? Why are you doing all of this? I mean, honestly, I just really like everything the field has to offer. I am kind of like a Pitt practice case in myself in the sense that I did the summer fellowship and Nia was my mentor there. And I loved the opportunity I had to work in a government agency. It was inspiring. It was exciting. It was a lot more fast-paced and impactful than I thought it would be. I think a lot of those myths that they were talking about are things that I had held until I had the chance to do pit work myself. And I want to give other people that chance to kind of have firsthand ability to break down those myths. Yeah, so Nia, you've, you've had these wonderful student leaders like Anjali and others in the room together now mm -hmm. at the summit. Um, you had some really fascinating sessions happening at the MLK Library including, I think, a, a workshop on civic engagement. Yes. So tell me a little bit about what it's, what, what it's been like having all the students together in the same room and what were some of the interesting uh, conversations and, uh, and activities that you did uh, down at the library? Sure, so the first session was Jess and Anjali and Fatima, a few of our students came together to do peer-to-peer -peer learning to really talk about as student leaders, how are you able to inspire other student leaders to do, to able to do this work? Um, and then after that, we heard from the ACLU folks, and then we had a session from Alina um, and Mashika, who are civic tech and democracy. You just bring um, the mic up a little bit, sure. just a little bit. Yep. Civic tech and democracy folks who are doing local engagement, civic engagement and community engagement. So we talk about voting as a very pivotal um, just tool for us and as we're engaging with democracy, but also what about these council members and engaging with um, Anytime you have a, a chance for public comment, having your voice heard beyond every two or four years when we have election cycles. So those were some of the absolutely incredible sessions that we had yesterday. I'm so grateful to our speakers. And the students had incredible questions, as you heard yesterday, about how they can engage with these processes. Um, and it's been so incredible to have everyone in a room together uh, beyond Zoom and beyond having everyone on their disparate campuses, being able to have a chance for us to bounce ideas off of each other and find community that I mentioned earlier has been a really incredible opportunity. And I will just ask you, you're both leaders in this space and you're also future leaders. What qualities or characteristics do you think are required to lead in public interest tech? I mean, I can. Sure. <laughs> Um, I think openness, adaptability, being able to communicate across disciplines is absolutely crucial for public interest technology. Um, having an ability to engage communities, because we don't want to just build for, we want to build with. So when we talk about building technology, how can we engage the communities and people that they're going to be impacting to be able to um, communicate across community lines, across demographic lines, across disciplines, all of that's going to be ex extremely crucial for Pitt. I want to I want to double click on that notion of building with communities and, and ask Anjali, I know you've done some really interesting work with community partners in Ann Arbor, so can you tell us a little bit about what some of those partnerships have looked like, what kinds of challenges you're trying to um, trying to address uh, and, and how you've done that? Yeah, definitely. I think the way that we go about what we call our project teams is that we seek out nonprofits or local organizations in the Ann Arbor and Metro Detroit area. So one example is on campus, we have the Maize and Blue Cupboard, and it's a food pantry that ensures that no person in the Ann Arbor area, no person on campus has to go hungry. One thing that we've done for them is that we took a team of UX designers and software engineers, and we helped build an app that could track what food and donations they had coming in what rate they were leaving at, and how to have volunteers sign up online. So it's just an easier process getting people in and out the door to help out. And so that was a really exciting opportunity for us. We get a lot of chances to do things like that because we get to work with local partners, contribute to our community, and also students get a chance to learn. And so I think that is something that is really undervalued is the ability, like students are entering into college pretty stressed out. They want to make an impact, but they also want something for their resume. Having a kind of place that achieves both 
and makes as much of an impact to the people they're surrounded by is really key in my opinion. Brilliant work and congratulations and thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Nia. Thank you, Anjali. It's great to have you here. Enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so Renee, as we as we wind down this this first segment talking about future directions for Pitt UN, I'm I'm curious what what strikes you, what um, what stands out to you as something you're excited to be a part of as a Pitt UN member as we continue to grow the network. Uh, well, I'm excited by the work we're doing at UVA. Uh, we have a brilliant team. Uh, my co-director, uh, Dr. John uh, Goodall, uh, he has uh, really been the uh, driving force. Uh, we have just some brilliant uh, sort of leadership. We have Dr. Jess Rea, who's been doing spectacular work. We have Dr. Mona Sloan. Uh, you know, we have Dr. Claudia Schultz. Why is it I'm only calling a woman, right? <laughs> we have Dr. John Kropko. We have, he is just, to me, uh, one of the most brilliant minds when it comes to civic tech. And I'm really proud to be a part of that team. Uh, we also have a Pathways program that's led, uh, uh, you know, uh, coming out of, of the uh, vice uh, provost office. And there's this commitment. We just launched our newsletter. Mm. Uh, and uh, we really are trying to, even in the near future, create uh, a pitch undergraduate uh, track uh, because we're so committed to this work. Because I think the relationship between uh, UVA and, and Charlottesville really is one that creates the space for uh, public interest technology to do the kind of community-inspired, community-driven, to build with communities. And I'm just so proud to be a part of that team. I am so proud to learn from them. Our master's program uh, usually has a substantive, substantive amount of capstones that are public interest technology capstones, working uh, with environmental groups in Charlottesville, working with the fire department, looking at, uh, at hazards, the ways in which we need to build uh, more resilience in the community. And, and that really is positive for me. Uh, from this program here, uh, just that global movement uh, or bringing together the global and what we're doing here in the U.S., uh, having that global majority, global minority uh, connection, the global north, global south coming together. That's something that I am very, very passionate about. And, and just seeing if we could include more voices from Latin America, from Caribbean, from India, from Africa, and really uh, getting this movement to where it needs to be. So uh, super pa and always passionate to be here with you. Yeah, yes. yeah, oh, it's great. And, and it's, it's wonderful to also hear uh, what, what drives people, right? You, you continue to come back to that question, what drives you in this work? I think there's so many ways that people can get into public interest technology. There's so many emerging opportunities uh, in terms of career paths. There's emerging uh, research opportunities for faculty. There's so many ways that people in civil society and in government can really take some of these uh, frameworks and practices and um, build and deploy and govern technology for, for the public good. And it's, good. it's hard work, mm -hmm. and it's tough work, and sometimes it feels like thankless work, but it's good work because you can see the kind of change. You know you're doing the work that's impacting, and oftentimes we always speak about the social justice or the data justice aspect of it, but there are other things that we can do when it comes to policy, when it comes to the work of government, when it comes to making government and citizen interactions easier, when it comes to things like cybersecurity, e-governance. You know, there are so many diverse spaces uh, when it comes to public interest technology. I think it's very exciting work, and I'm going to uh, stay in this space for quite some time. That's wonderful. So coming up in just a few minutes, we are going to talk to some more of those people who are doing that tough but good work um, in the public sector. We're going to talk with some folks who, who lead fellowship programs, placing young technologists in government. We're going to speak with some, uh, some healthcare professionals about the role of AI in healthcare. And we're also going to talk to some lawyers and some legal professionals about technology and law. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here on the Pitt UN Summit Live studio. We're going to take a short three to four minute break. Um, so you'll be guided to, uh, to join the next uh, studio session if you're joining us through the live stream. And we'll, uh, we'll see you again here soon. Thanks so much for joining us.